And I remember the, the last time, or the first time that Alloy came to the community board, they said cavalierly that no one knew where Skimmerhorn Slip was and that it was never used. Uh, you do have a concern about that slip. I don't know if the traffic study, uh, if you looked at it, but that's an impact. That is, and there's no way you can mitigate uh, that loss of that slip in your, you know, in your study because of the right traffic flow. We learned that because we did map Fifth Avenue and we built the Barclays Center. Uh, there's an issue now where we can literally not move and the mere fact that DLT is going to give and have been gifting developers public space, I think, I think enough is enough on that. Related to the Sermon Point Slip, that is actually a DOT initiative that has been underway in terms of proposal and some pilot programs that took place last year, where they took a look at what the diversions and what the travel, uh, how many cars used it, and so on. That is independent of this proposal. This is something that DOT could possibly move forward with independent of this project. To the extent that our project, if approved, moves forward, we would coordinate with DOT in terms of how that open space is designed and how it operates. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. In your presentation, in your one question, graphic, okay. one question. In your graphic, you have subsumed the slip in your development. That is represented both with the project and without the project, that that slip is closed because that is our understanding based on the discussions with DOT. That is independent of our project, although if this project is approved, it would be integrated so that there is a more seamless urban design uh, uh, component to it. Thank you. Um, if I could ask, um, thank you for your presentation. If you could put the agenda, fantastic. Thank you. Um, now we're going to proceed with the next item on the agenda. We have a pre-agreed upon 10-minute presentation from the Vaughan Hill Society. Uh, association. So, is someone going to represent the Long Hill Association? Ten minute time allowed. First of all, thank you for the time. Uh, I do want to point out while I'm shuffling my notes that I've asked the community board to, to uh, take my presentation during the process over the course of last months uh, to try to update the land use committee. While Alloy had multiple presentations, I was begging to have one. So I'm grateful for this opportunity. My name is Howard Collins. I'm president of the Borham Hill Association, which is which is a volunteer, all-volunteer organization that advocates for our neighborhood. We seek to uh, build community through education and through community events. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the neighborhood reacted to this proposal from day one and, and what our history has been. So about, a, about April of last year, we saw this proposal. Um, let me get this out of my way. And it is not a full city block. It is partial city block. I hope you can, that's the world's worst mouse. I hope you can see that this is not a full city block. If it were a full city block, it would be sitting in the middle of 300 Ashland. So part of that is a, is a challenge for the community, and part of it, quite frankly, is a challenge for the developer in everything the RFEI asks them to do. Uh, this very partial, this fact, when we looked at this initially, we thought that it was too tall and too close. The further we got into it, we just realized it's too much. It's just too much. Uh, this plan is overloaded beyond reason. And the ECF is not a developer interested in anything other than maximizing square footage. This particular project is often blind to its surroundings, and therefore the BHA's main point of opposition is the tripling of the floor, ratio, floor area ratio. 
We had many meetings with our community, the Borham Hill community, and with our nearby neighbors at Fort Greene. Uh, thank you, Fort Greene residents, for coming out tonight. We came to a couple of very clear conclusions. You can see in this slide. And consensus is very hard to come by. We need intelligent development that doesn't ignore Borham Hill. It needs to blend downtown with Borham Hill. It needs to have neighborhood context. There needs to be, in the third bullet point, real planning, sensible zoning, and neighborhood sensitivity. And then the formulaic maximizing of the FAR to 18 while all of downtown is limited to 12 makes no sense and certainly makes no sense at this residential block right across the street at State Street. Uh, we took the sum, this summary of this position. Um, as you know, the mayor held town halls prior to an election. Our council member, Steve Levin, uh, went with us to a subsequent meeting. The mayor recognized me, connected us with Commissioner Lago at DCP. We sent a letter with these following points. Very much, I'll just even read the slide, but we oppose the tripling of the FAR. We thought, and Steve Levin backed us up, we wanted to delay certification and opening up a conversation with the community about what we might do differently. We didn't say, don't build anything. We said, it needs, to re needs transitional zoning. And we suggested, in this slide I said demand, R6B townhouses on the north side of State Street to create comparable scale and a 50-foot setback. That would eliminate the State Street loading dock and keep all the trash off the street. We also asked for a similar 50-foot setback on 3rd Avenue for any new building over four stories. We suggested there be only one tower and that it be glare-free. We support the new high school. It's a travesty that the Khalil Gibran School has to be in that very unusable building and they had to make do for so many years. They have been part of our community for so long and we want them to stay. State Street. Five minutes. Thank you. Many people felt that State Street is a very bad location for a new elementary school because it's bordered by, th especially in the morning, by three of the worst traffic roads in Brooklyn, 3rd Avenue, 4th Avenue, the routing up to 3rd Avenue, and Flatbush. And uh, it would require some very big uh, crossing guards. And also, we also realized, we think that eight years of construction for the high school is unreasonable and not conducive to education. That came up repeatedly. Uh, we have this graphic, um, I, actually before we get to this I should say, you can study that. Uh, we went to DCP with our letter, uh, which I will submit as testimony, the full letter, and we thought we'd have a conversation, but no conversation took place. The commissioner referred us to this process, ULERP, as a place for conversation, which it is really not. It is a place, unfortunately, for adversarial relationships, and it really doesn't work out very well. Simply put, we regret the lack of engagement with the community on the, these important issues on the prior slide, but I would remiss if I didn't thank Al Alloy for meeting with the Borough Hill residents repeatedly for their patience in discussing the loading dock, trash, traffic, construction, building facades, but our, pun intended, larger issues could never be discussed. It is not in, in the plan's interest or Alloy's interest to take 20 stories off the building. It, it would not be responsive to the RFEI either. So we ask you to deny the change of FAR to 18 and begin a real conversation that includes the community and the residents that live here now. At 986 feet, the taller tower will be the largest in Brooklyn and the 16th tallest in New York City. The DCP's website. Three minutes. Thank you. The DCP website mentions many valuable zoning con concepts. Is this the the DCP's version of a collaborative and participatory approach? Good zoning should respect neighborhood character, which this development often ignores. Bulk should not overwhelm our neighborhoods. I'll just keep reading. And DCP's trend, is this DCP's transition between the high-rise core of the central business district and the adjacent residential neighborhood? Is it really the proper scale? Upzoning this lot to the highest density zoning district in New York City, a district zoning that is currently found only in lower Manhattan, 
in an area that should be stepping down from downtown is a violation of the public trust. Let's work with the community and do better. Thank you. I'm going to hand the uh, other minutes to Sue Wolf to talk about an example where the community did uh, very nicely with transitional zoning. And I'm because it's lost, you have two minutes. My name is Sue Wolf, former president of the Borham Hill Association. I'm going to focus on transitional zoning and neighborhood context. The BA, BHA has never been anti development. We have consistently supported intelligent development. As an example, in 1980, 98-99, the BHA working with Borough President Howard Golden established a sensible plan for transitional zoning from State to Livingston Street. When you walk north on Hoyt Street from the Atlantic Avenue Special Zoning District, you see new State Street townhouses side by side with historic ones. As you continue north on the south side of Skemmerhorn, Buildings grow to 140 street, 140 feet, uh, eight to 12 stories. You see the state One minute. Renaissance Court building, home to Brooklyn Fair, Common Ground to the west and Holiday Inn to the east. No building south of Scammerhorn is taller than 140 feet. On the north side of Scammerhorn, new residents. Boyd and Horn rises to 240 feet, and a similar building has opened at 33 Bond. The transition continues moving north with 189 Scammerhorn, and finally to Fulton Street, where City Point rises higher still. In a few short blocks, a meaningful transition blends low rise and high rise in a workable plan that was developed with active community input. At the 80 Flatbush development site, Transitional zoning is completely ignored. This is why we ask for the construction of a row of townhouses on the north side of State Street to act as a buffer between high rise and low rise Brooklyn. On the website, DCP says, DCP has continued to fine tune the zoning resolution to better address issues of neighborhood character. While we recognize the need to grow intelligently, I need to point out that the Borham Hill neighborhood exists. We are not downtown Brooklyn. We live here now. So DPC and the 80 Flatbush development should honor us with their respect, creating a buffer. Tripling the FAR to 18 is too aggressive for this site. Thank you. We're now going to enter into the public testimony portion of the public hearing. And so once again, let me repeat a few things. If the comments that you need to make are not on this white pad behind me, then by all means, please feel free to take your full two minutes. If the comments are already representative here, then I'd ask that you would defer your time to the next speaker behind you. We are going to call speakers by number. So if you have a ticket, the ticket should start out with three digits. Um, four, six, seven, and then re three remaining digits. I'm only gonna call the three remaining digits. So to start this off, I'm gonna start with zero, zero, one. So whoever has zero, zero, one, please come to the podium. As this gentleman or this woman is coming to the podium, I wanna also remind everyone that written testimony is acceptable. So if you have written testimony with you, you wanna present it, we'll take it. If you would like to submit it to the board office, you can do that as well, and remind you that you can have a portion of the land use committee public forum or speakers list during their meeting, which is where they're going to take a vote on tonight's project. Okay? Thank you. You have two minutes. Uh, my name is Irene Van Slyke. I'm a member of the Boone Hill Association, and I've lived, in, I've lived in. Can you state your last name? Yeah. Um, I've lived in Boone Hill for about 40 plus years. And I'm in opposition to the proposal for a zoning tax and map amendment to change the zoning from a C6-2 to a C6-6 district. 
I urge the committee to vote no on the increase in height allowed under C6-6. It's totally unnecessary. A C6-2, the present designation, according to the New York City planning website, typically are mapped in areas outside central business core, such as the Lower East Side, and in general go up to about 400 feet. The application for C6-6, according to New York City planning, is appropriate only within the special midtown district. Problem is that 80 Flatbush is not in a special midtown district. It's located between Boredom Hill and Fort Greene that are low-rise residential neighborhoods. In fact, 80 Flatbush Avenue will be right across the street from a three- and four-story brownstone on State Street. The draft scope of work cites the need for a school and affordable housing. If the city needs affordable housing and a school, it can be accomplished without upzoning. The tax exempt bonding and city subsidies would still be available without being part of a luxury housing development. To the credit of the developers, they do not say that there is a need for more luxury housing because there is a glut. The Daily News last Sunday cited the Census Bureau survey that found 247,000 units of luxury housing that remain empty. In the past three years, it increased by about 35%. The reason, renters cannot afford to pay the high rents. Here's another thought before you vote. Remember how downtown Brooklyn renters were asked to move from their affordable apartments to make room for a one-acre park on Willoughby Street. The community board was asked for its support. Where is that park now? Council Member Levin admits he's embarrassed because we're asking people to give up something for the public good, but it didn't happen. Remember Atlantic Yards? The developer, Mr. Radner, said he needed to build higher, he needed tax exempt bonds, he needed subsidies, more and more. When he got all that, what did he do? He sold the land, development rights, and all the subsidies to the Chinese government. We are paying for that. So please vote no. Ticket 002. Yes. Ready? Oops. Okay, I changed my testimony a little bit. My name is Sandy Balboza. I'm representing the Atlantic Avenue Betterment Association and advocacy group for Atlantic Avenue from 4th Avenue to Hicks Street. So um, schools and affordable housing are a distraction. This hearing is about a massive map change. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, this, this attempt by Alloy development and the ECF to nearly triple the FAR would be inappropriate and irresponsible development. When the Department of City Planning established the Unified Bulk Program, the communities of Borham Hill, Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill, and Fort Greene were informed that the zoning changes were designed to protect the adjacent low-scale historic residential neighborhoods by creating a transitional contextual buffer at the peripheries in the downtown district. In 2001, the City Council approved the special downtown Brooklyn district rezoning. After months of intense discussions between uh, city planning, area residents, community organizations, and the business community, it was designed to ensure that development could and should occur within the confines of the downtown Brooklyn business core without encroaching on the surrounding residential neighborhoods. The 80 Flatbush site did not get upzoned when the special downtown Brooklyn district was created. Now, Alloy is seeking a tower zoning. In a clear abrogation of the understanding that the Department of City Planning reached with the adjacent lower scale residential neighborhoods, city planning and ECF have encouraged spot zoning for Alloy 
without any dialogue with the affected community. Two seconds here. Two seconds here. Yeah. Two seconds. Uh -oh. Okay. Alloy Development has the opportunity to develop their project under the current uh, as of right zoning regulations, zoning that is more compatible with the low-lying neighborhoods. We urge Community Board 2 to vote against a map change for 80 Flatbush. This zoning should not be changed for a special interest group. Okay, so now that I think we've got the hang of this, what I'm going to ask is this gentleman, if you'd stand up and let somebody sit there, please. And then, is this your Can we, would, we grab your coat? I'm going to call speaker number three, and I'm going to ask four and five to sit here so we can kind of move things along. So speaker number three, and whoever has ticket number four and five, please sit in the seats in the front. And it was just following that format. Thank you. Project. This project will bring criti critical in public infrastructure to Brooklyn with two new public schools, mar market rate and affordable housing, a new cultural and community facility, and Class A office space. And the project delivers all of this public benefit without the use of any city capital funds at one of the most transit-rich locations in New York City. According to the, New York, to the um, U.S. Census Bureau, New York City's population hit a record 8.6 million last year, at the highest rate of growth since we've seen since the 1920s. Brooklyn has led that growth, taking in more than any county in the state. Brooklyn has seen an unprecedented residential and commercial growth over the past 10 years, and we need to be strategic about how and where that growth can be accommodated. The area surrounding the intersection of Flatbush 4th and Atlantic Avenues has been an active hub dating back to the completion of the Williamsburg Savings Bank in 1929, with its extensive access to transit, especially along Flatbush and Atlantic Terminal, we believe 80 Flatbush is particularly appropriate. With the proximity to Manhattan and easy access to the rest of the borough, 80 Flatbush is not only attractive to residents, but to the entrepreneurs and businesses of various sizes. It's an also an, a great opportunity here for smaller companies and startups to take advantage of the new office space as a part of the project. One of the 2004's rezoning's main goals was to create this office space and this remains just as important today. I praise Alloy for including it. In addition, 80 Flatbush would bring much needed school infrastructure to the neighborhood with two new state-of-the-art facilities, a replacement for Cahill Gibran International Academy and the new 350-seat public elementary school. The Arab-American community has a rich history in this neighborhood, and the students uh, of the city's first English Arab Arabic public school deserve to have modern facilities. The new gym, cafeteria, library, state-of-the-art science labs, and dedicated art and dance rooms are all part of this proposal. Just as important, the new K-5 school will help alleviate District 15's overcrowding and accommodate anticipated growth in the neighborhood. Not only will the school seats created by the project accommodate the demand created by its new residential units, but Alloy's proposal will have a net positive benefit of 164 seats for the district without any SCA funding. The project also provides 15,000 cultural, 15,000 square foot cultural facility adjacent to the cultural district, which is greatly in need of subsidized space. Alloy is currently donating valuable work and rehearsal space to brick artists, recess assembly, harvest works, and issue project room at the site, exemplifying its support. Uh, wrap it up? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, New York City is in... Please, please stop. Let's not do that. Please, let's be collaborative. New York City is in a housing crisis, and the need for affordable housing has never been greater. Of that, 
Project. Okay. Oh, yes, please. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, so, just go ask ticket number five and seven. I need you to fill the front of your seats if you have five and seven. Six. Okay, six, come on up. Uh, Who's number seven? Hi. Uh, my name is Ron Jana. I'm coordinator of the... I'll give it to you. Uh, my, my name is Ron Jana. I'm coordinator of the Rockwell Place Community Garden on Flatbush Avenue, directly north of the proposed alloy development. Our 38 volunteer members have voted unanimously to oppose the rezoning after learning from Alloy's EIS that our public amenity will be irremediably damaged by the shadow of their development, giving us less than four hours of prime sunlight daily. The garden was founded in 1980 on a vacant triangle at a time when Brooklyn had been left for dead. Original members lived in the sparsely populated streets nearby. In the 1990s, the late Renata Kammerer, whom many of you will remember on the Parks Committee, helped the garden become one of the first 17 community gardens in New York put forward as an official Parks Department Green Thumb Garden. At that time, the garden went through this same entire ULERT process and received strong endorsement of this board, for which we remain deeply grateful. As a result, when the MTA demolished the garden in 2005 to build the Rockwell fan plant underneath, they were required to rebuild the garden, which they did in 2008 grandly, assuming at the time that the zoning of the block to the south, the block in question, had already been decided in 2004, assuring the garden of summer sunlight. More than one million dollars of public funds went into the restoration, something we could never even imagine on our annual budget of $600. Contrary to Alloy's unsupported assertion, there is no nearby sunlit public space that offers comparable access or enjoyment to the stream of public visitors. Zoning was introduced in New York City in 1916 to tame development and save sunlight for citizens. Now Brooklyn, once dead, is coming back to life, but its streets are going dark. Our garden stands to be the unwitting victim of unpredictable spot rezoning spinning out of control. We were here when no one was here. We want to be here for generations to come. You Community Board 2 saved us once, you can save us again. Our annual daffodils in honor of 9-11 are coming into bloom today. Come visit us yourselves and see how important the sunlight is. We're calling on you to reject the rezoning and the alloy proposal and save our sunlight. Thank you. people who were in line down the block who could not get in today. And they were a really angry looking mob. They wanted to be in here. So I'm pretty sure I know what side they were on. Um, my name is Lucy Coteen. I've lived in Fort Greene for over 40 years. Um, my comments are this. This is a quote. The project site is located in a prominent location on Flatbush Avenue at the entrance to downtown Brooklyn. So says the DEIS. I wonder who writes that nonsense. It's absurd, the entrance to downtown Brooklyn. When understanding this project, ask for it first, what are the developer benefits? That is the place to start to unpack this and other developments. The highly touted benefits are questionable for this project, but the negative effects clearly are not. There is no concern for the perpetual mistruth told that the development is in downtown Brooklyn when it is in Borm Hill. Zoning and neighborhood definitions were put into place to protect neighborhood character. There is a cost. These costs, costs can and must be quantified. For the sake of time, a very partial list. I have much longer I wrote, but this is really quick. One, currently 7,500 units of housing in the area pipeline are there with a glut of market rate housing. Two, traffic backed up now on 3rd and 4th Avenue. One minute. This will add the lane will be blocked from, from demolition construction plus hundreds of workers coming into the neighborhood. Three, 
the BQE closure with a triple cantilever rebuild that was occurring at the same time, which means that all the traffic that's now in the BQE parking lot will be going through our local streets, 3rd and 4th Avenue primarily. Four, add closing of the Skimmerhorn slip to that traffic. Five, 2,000 plus new residents with no parking. Rich people have cars, by the way, and parking is already impossible. Six, rats, rats, and more rats. Seven, transit rich location. Ha, ha, ha. Can't get on the subway now at rush hour. Eight, health of students living through eight years of noise, dust, harassment. The school will most likely lose a lot of enrollment. Who will want to send their kids to that school? Nine, wrong placement for elementary schools. School will be filled from within anyway. Ten, city will pay rent for school. City paying Extel now two point two. $2 million, $17 million per year for a free school building. Shadows will kill gardens, and they extend as far as Fort Green Park. Almost finished. 12, the richest cultural area in Brooklyn right now. We don't need more culture. 13, killing neighborhood character. 14, there's no penalty written in for delay or no affordable housing. Uh, what, often, as we know, the affordable housing is not affordable for the people who really need it. And 16, it will block the most iconic landmark in Brooklyn. Don't block the clock, block the tower. <laughs> Ticket holders 9 and 10, please come up front. Ticket holders 9 and 10, please come up front. I just want to say amen to everything that Lucy Coteen just said. I'm going to be brief. My name is Philip Superior, and I'm, I'm identifying myself because I have been a resident of Fort Greene since 1976. Alongside my neighbors, I have worked as a community builder through our local community organizations, as a member of the 88th Precinct Community Council, as president of the Carlton Willoughby Block Association. My quest for neighborhood betterment included services as a member of this community board too for quite a few years. I have worked my entire 42 years here to preserve and nurture the neighborhoods of Brook Brownstone, Brooklyn. I say that not for, in, to in self aggrandizement I say that to establish bona fides. The 80 Flatbush Towers project would be contrary to our community benefit efforts and an affront to everything that our neighborhood has struggled to become. We should be clear that although 80 Flatbush Towers would front on Flatbush Avenue, now absolutely overgrown with towers, it actually is in the residential brownstone neighborhood of, of Borm Hill and adjacent to the residential brownstone community of Fort Greene. It is not in downtown Brooklyn. Its completion would magnify the density in our community and have detrimental effects on our historic neighborhoods. It triples the allowable far from 6 to 10, a huge increase that creates unprecedented density, increased traffic impacts during construction and afterwards in the immediate area and evenly in the rel relatively close neighborhoods, residential, as automobiles and trucks seek alternative routes through smaller streets in Brooklyn Heights, Fort Greene, Bormeal, Prospect Park, and other neighborhoods, creating additional traffic safety issues for residents, pour additional inhabitants into already crowded public transportation systems in the area and make life more difficult for all users of areas cultural amenities such as the Brooklyn Academy of Music and all of the other cultural amenities in the neighborhood. I want to just say one, in closing that I agree with Senator Montgomery and with Assemblymember Joanne Simon that this is density is unprecedented and it is less than a school less a school project than a mixed use commercial and residential development with a small element of educational space. We who have struggled to make our homes and community manageable and accessible agree strongly with these elected officials. Please say no to 80 Flatbush Avenue development proposals. Ticket number nine. The hold of ticket 10 and 11, please come up front. Okay, great. Ticket number 10, uh, 10 and 12, please come up front. Hello, my name is Lissa Wolf, and I live above Betty Bakery, so I think some of you know where I am. Um, okay, people, let's talk trash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From the draft EIS, this is solid waste disposal at 80 Flatbush. 
As part of project planning, building design and operation would incorporate on-site trash storage to minimize placement of trash on sidewalks. The project, the proposed project would generate a net increase of approximately 19.7 tons of solid waste per week and approximately 67% or 13 Point three tons of incremental solid waste would be generated, handled by DSNY. Think about this area and how many tons we could get into this area. <laughs> this would be containerized, either picked up at curbside or specified locations within project buildings. One minute. Curbside pickup would entail the loading of trash into eight cubic yard containers, which would be wheeled out onto the street for pickup by DSNY rear loader trucks. That's not going to cause any, like, you know, harm. Um, with sufficient on-site location and access, DSI roll-on, roll-off service would occur inside the buildings. Under either option, trash would be in containers, kept off sidewalks, minimizing rodents and odors. Well, thank you. Uh, refuse bags would be loaded into mechanized containers located inside project buildings for pickup for further compactation. Uh, DSA roll-on, roll-off container-bearing trucks require special considerations. Um, uh, which would be like 20-foot clearance. Um, compact containers are not allowed in design. Loading docks must be uh, supplemental loading areas. Alloy must commit to solid waste solution that doesn't stink for State Street. Take a hold of number two. Hi, my name is Heather Taylor and I live on State Street. Yeah. And let me tell you, I am not looking forward to this build because I've lived there for five years now. All of those five years have been taken up with the hub build. My building backs up to the ball cart in the park. The noise has been incredible. And not to mention that when the trucks come to this proposed new site, they're going to come down State Street and they're going to idle in front of my building and honk their horns like they did all through the build for the hub. And let me tell you, I feel so badly for those brownstones in that 500 block and nobody has talked about those people. And I just think it's criminal that this is going to happen on their front lawn. And I just want to read you one little thing. I talked to a, uh, a salesperson at the Apple store and I told him this build was going to happen. One minute. And he said, oh, that is really a shame. I love that little street. He said, have you ever noticed when you turn the corner off of Flatbush onto State, it gets quiet. And I said, yes, I know. And that quiet's going to be gone for eight years. Forever. Wow. Forever. Hi, I'm Paul Carell. Um, I also live on State Street and I just met Heather tonight, and uh, thank you, Heather, for seeing some of your time. I live on the block that's Caddy Corner, across the street from uh, the proposed site, and I, have, I object to it very strenuously because of the fact that it's going to block my view of the uh, Williamsburg Savings Bank, which I consider an icon. I've uh, done Christmas cards on that uh, very subject and sent them out to friends. And they love it. And, you know, I, I can't do my artwork that way. Uh, uh, the other uh, elements of uh, not having, you know, a safe and sane environment while the construction goes on, that goes double for me. And I know many neighbors on my street oppose this project, uh, both for the density that it'll bring and the demolition of some very nice uh, education buildings, you know, board of, in the old days, Board of Education, where you got your working papers and stuff like that. And I, I can't see why we have to do this at all. Okay, thank you. Take a hold of 12. Take a hold of 13 and 14. Please come up. 13 and 14, please come up. Thank you. <laughs>
Hello, my name is Norman Ryan. I live in Fort Greene at One Hanson Place. I'm a member of the MetroTech Bid Board, and I'm a former board member of the Fort Greene Park Conservancy. My family immigrated to Brooklyn over 100 years ago. I grew up hearing my parents talk about why they loved Brooklyn. It was the bar of parks, churches, synagogues, they'd say, an, o an oasis from the canyons of Manhattan. I'm here tonight because the Brooklyn communities that my parents loved, that I love, and that millions of other love are being threatened. Threatened by a developer who, despite boastful claims to have responded to public feedback, has shown cavalier disregard to countless objections to this monstrous overbuild inside the heart of a historic residential Brooklyn neighborhood. The only substantive change I've seen to propose tower massing since the initial scoping process last June has been a series of four five-foot setbacks on the phase one tower, and remarkably to only the west-facing facade, a token adjustment that is not, does not demonstrate a willingness to listen, react responsibly to public outcry. There is good reason for rational zoning and well-considered urban design, one that acknowledges quality of life, neighborhood character, scale, and density. To triple the density of this cornerstone site in a residential transitional neighborhood that is not, and I repeat, not located in downtown Brooklyn, is to set a dangerous precedent throughout New York City for unchecked development and ultimately the undoing of countless precious historic neighborhoods De development cannot and should not trump rational public policy. Let's grow Brooklyn, but let's do it in a way that makes sense for its residents. Access to good schools, affordable housing are critical issues facing our city. Sadly, Alloy and the ECF have glibly used both as sugarcoating to sell their plan. When a close examination of the numbers reveals the principal goal of, of goal of this project is plain and simple, profit. When I and other Brooklyn residents met with Marty Markowitz five years ago regarding Two Trees proposed development of 300 Ashland, Borough President Markowitz included in his report on the proposal, among other recommendations, an exhortation to the developer to, quote, produce a building layout that keeps intact the, present, the presence of one of the borough's most iconic structures, the landmark Williamsburg Savings Bank, unquote. He went on to state that, quote, there's merit in wanting to retain the tower as an iconic skyline feature, unquote. Two trees, to their credit, listen. I, res I expect current Brooklyn Bar Borough President Eric Adams, Council Member Steve Levin, and you who represent our community to take a similar view on the paramount importance of balancing growth with intelligent, contextualized urban design. Brooklyn deserves better than this. The greater good deserves better than this. I implore you to reject this proposal and demand that alternative options for an economically sound and environmentally conscious build out of this site be developed. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Sillette, and I'm here to voice my opposition to A.D. Flatbush. As a mother of an elementary school child, I have great concerns about placing an elementary school at Flatbush and State Street, combining very small children as young as five years old with one of the busiest streets in Brooklyn is a recipe for disaster. Tragedy can strike on much less crowded Brooklyn streets as we have recently seen in Park Slope. All of these elementary schools nearby are nestled on quiet streets with big beautiful playgrounds. Instead, Alloy wants to put our children near a street that has had three to five pedestrian accidents both at State and Flatbush and Third and Flatbush this year alone. And with pedestrians from all these giant new buildings, 27 in downtown Brooklyn alone, 27 new buildings, not counting. Always. Um, do we want to add five, six, seven-year-old children exiting school full of energy, unaware of the danger created by a car-infested area? I have walked past State and Flatbush at 2.30 p.m. many times, and I am fearful of what adding young children to this corner will lead to. There will also be no street-level courtyard playground for these children, unlike every other school in this neighborhood. Children are released from school in a courtyard so they can run around outside after sitting for most of the day. Alloway is going to put this playground on the roof. Parents are already complaining about trying to get their children across Blackbush. Mountains of trash piled street side combined with the wind tunnels these buildings create make it a harrowing experience. I have seen a woman carrying her baby knocked over by a car turning from 3rd Avenue onto Flatbush. We can do better than Flatbush and State Street as a location for a new school. Do we care so little about the safety of our children? I would never allow my eight-year-old son to ch attend a school in such a dangerous location. 
create 3,000 jobs, strengthen the commercial corridor of Flatbush, and provide much needed Class A office space to Brooklyn. It is imperative that as a borough, we manage growth carefully. Considering all of the public benefits of this project, 80 Flatbush is an example of smart development we need, and we urge you to help make this project a reality. Demand for office space in downtown Brooklyn is at a record high, driven by tremendous growth in creative businesses and innovation. More and more, companies want to base their businesses in downtown Brooklyn, and as a result, commercial vacancy rates are close to 3%, which threatens to slow the area's strong recent job growth. This project will deliver 200,000 square feet of Class A office space, and critically, it is well located on Flatbush Avenue and close to Atlantic Terminal, collect, connecting it to all of New York City and Long Island. Commercial tenants coming to Brooklyn today are looking, looking for office space located in vi vibrant, diverse areas. As a result, the mixed-use nature of this project is attractive. Equally, the commercial floor plates, which are approximately 10,000 square feet, are well-sized for creative companies coming into the market. In addition to delivering much-needed office space, we strongly support the project's proposed affordable housing and new school facilities. We are in a severe housing crisis, and 80 Flatbush will bring 900 units of new housing, 200 of which will be permanently affordable, to one of the city's most transit-rich sites. In addition, the aging facilities at Khalil Gibran International School cannot meet the current needs of the Arab American community. Providing them with a new school shows our commitment to educating all of our children to diversity and speaks to the strength of our multicultural heritage. ELA has proven itself attentive to community needs, having held over 100 community stakeholder meetings and incorporating many suggestions. The Brooklyn Chamber is in strong support of this project. Thank you. State Street, and I'm here to say no to 80 Flatbush, and I'm going to urge the members of CB2 to also say no. This project exists uh, solely for the developers and for ECF to burnish the reputations and their bank accounts. There is zero demand in the neighborhood for this project. A recent article in the New York Times titled, As Brooklyn Towers Soar, A Sinking Feeling for Developers, describes Douglas Steiner as grousing about the timing of his building the hub which is currently well below capacity, as are most of the other luxury towers that now dot our Brooklyn skyline like an awkward gap-toothed jack-o'-lantern. Well, if Steiner got in too late, what does that make this project? 
A recent article in the Daily News states the unoccupied city has ballooned by 65,000 apartments since 2014, an astonishing 35% jump in size in the last three years. Today, almost 250,000 units, more than 11% of all rental apartments in all New York City, sit either empty or scarcely occupied. Housing shortage? Come on. Again, if you live here, it's obvious there's no demand for more luxury rentals, which is the backbone of this development, and the sole reason for its existence. The canard of new schools and a small percentage of moderate income rentals are designed purely for the tax breaks they allow the developers to collect and their desire to receive a variance. Is there demand for more school seats here in Brooklyn? Of course, but not in this part of District 15. This is a proposed development over 1 million square feet, but only 15% will be schools. There are no buildings this tall in the West Village, in the East Village, on the Upper West Side or on the Upper East Side. Is this residential area to be transformed into Midtown Manhattan? My son stole my line there. If this project goes through, Despite overwhelming community opposition, after 10 years, my prediction is that these huge hulking towers will stand mostly vacant as an ode to Trumpism. Money and greed and ego superseding our own sense of what our neighborhoods and Brooklyn stands for. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me just make this quick announcement. It's been brought to my attention that there are several people who signed the sign the sheet more than one time, um, and then there are people who have not gotten tickets. So bear with me as I'm gonna to try to deviate from the numerical system and we'll start pulling some names that are at the bottom because it appears as those are the individuals who don't have a ticket. And I wanna make sure we have a balanced audience um, for the public hearing. We've been waiting. So, so, I understand, I get it, so follow along. Um, the first I'm gonna call now is uh, Amari Lee. Amari Lee. Okay, great. The next one would be um, Fatima Saleh. Okay, great. Um, number 16. Ticket holder 16. Ticket holder 17. Come on up. Ticket holder 18, take a seat. Ticket holder 19, please take a seat. What ticket number are you? You're on the mic. to do my best to cut this down to like one and a half in the interest of time. Um, Vice Chairperson, Singletary, and Community Board 2 members, I am Camille Casaretti. I am the President of the District 15 Community Education Council and represent 35 elementary and middle schools in District 15. I would like to express our concerns about the proposed building development for 80 Flatbush Avenue and the potential impact on District 15 families and educators. Like you, we would like to work collaboratively and at the neighborhood level in this process, but we find that when developments reach this scale, community input seems to collapse. To date, we have not received even one positive comment for this project from the 300, I'm sorry, 30,000 families that we represent. As written, CEC 15 is unable to support the 80 Flatbush Avenue proposal. We hope that in opposing this proposal, more time will be allowed to negotiate the terms. CEC 15 passed a resolution in summary stating, the current proposal will not alleviate but likely exacerbate both the current student overcrowding issue and the school equity issue in District 15. CEC 15. <laughs> CEC 15 proposed that ECF and Alloy provide 750 to 1,000 primary school seats to truly address district overcrowding and segregation. We are still open to discussion and would like to find some common ground. 
Our real concerns include insurmountable problems with small elementary schools, in underestimating future seat this feat, sorry, in unestimating future seat need, this plan will exacerbate overcrowding. ECF just told us that they cannot build a larger elementary school. That is a choice by the developer. It isn't that they cannot, it's that they will not build a larger school. We have numerous student health and safety concerns, and lastly, we are concerned with responsible utilization of public resources. I go into much greater detail in the eight-page document that was emailed earlier to you all and here in print that's being passed around. With all of this in mind, we respectfully request that further conversations regarding this proposal continue until all stakeholders and constituencies are comfortable with moving forward. Thank you very much for your consideration. Hi, my name is Jonathan Glazer. I'm a State Street resident. The community board faces a daunting task in examining the proposed U look for 80 Flatbush. Ultimately, its approval or rejection hinges on an appraisal of the project's value to Brooklyn and New York. Tonight, we have heard the developers talk about the benefits of the project, the affordable housing, the public schools, a community space. What they did not discuss was, a, with, and something that a fair appraisal requires, are the full costs of the project. According to public sources, LA Development paid approximately $80 million for the parcels totaling 44,000 square feet. Current zoning on those parcels would allow construction of 307,000 square feet, which means LA paid $260 per square available foot. An approval of the Euler would transfer control of close to 1 million buildable square feet to Alloy at a $260 a square foot purchase price. That transfer of public real estate to a private entity is worth over $250 million. Wow. This windfall will dramatically increase the profit and rate of return on Alloy's initial investment. A further cost to the city taxpayers are the tax abatements for both the affordable housing and public school portions of the site that will be granted to Alloy. By focusing attention on the supposed $230 million in public benefits, Alloy has shielded the project's finances from serious scrutiny, and the exact amounts of these abatements have not been fully disclosed. The opportunity cost of this project should also be considered. The projected construction costs of $690 per square foot for the two schools exceed typical New York City construction costs. By not considering less alternative scenarios, the developers will be diverting scarce school facility funds away from other worthy projects. In the case of 80 Flatbush, the subsidies and incentives that the city will provide to a private developer far, are far in excess of the benefits that it will receive in return. For Brooklyn, this project has a negative net worth. I ask you to vote no on this proposal. Take it over to 18 to 19, please come in front. I'm number 19. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Hi, my name is David Krilovich. I'm a member of the Rockwell Bears Community Garden, directly north of the 80 Flatbush development. Our garden, our, our community, will irreversibly be affected by this upzoning. I encourage you to oppose this rezoning for the following reasons. Something not mentioned earlier. The 80 Flatbush site was already upzoned in the downtown Brooklyn plan in 2004 from 3.4 FAR to 6.0 FAR with appropriate sensitivity to surrounding brownstone blocks. According to the environmental impact statement, 80 Flatbush towers will cause our garden to go from more than 12 hours of sunlight a day to less than four hours. Vegetable and fruit trees need at least 10 hours of sunlight a day to produce. Many, if not all, our trees in the garden will die and basically cause a mass murder of vegetation in our garden. Woo! The proposed tower of 986 feet is out of context and its top floor would be higher than the top floor of the Chrysler building. If built 80 Flatbush could cast a shadow as far as Fort Greene Park on certain days. Thank you for listening, and I encourage you to vote no uh, on this rezoning. Uh, 
ticket number 20? I wish to release my time. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll pull for the list. Uh, pull for Cohen. Uh, my name is Roz Copic, O-P-I-C. What ticket number do you have? 21. Oh, I didn't close from the room yet. I thought you said 20. Somebody's going back and forth between. Yeah, somebody's going between the two lists. Oh, I'm sorry. But you can have a seat. You'll be next. Have a seat. Thank you.
and culture in changing lives and strengthening communities. Recess is a small, non-profit art organization that was founded in 2009. We met Alloy a couple of years ago. Alloy controlled a vacant retail space on Skimhorn and was eager to activate the space through cultural programming. The partnership we created has been surprising, unexpected, and has greatly surpassed our expectations. Alloy donated their storefront to us rent-free for two years, paid thousands of dollars for the fit-out, and provided all of the operational funds for us to run our new program called mm -hmm. Recess Assembly. Assembly is an artist-led diversion program for court-involved youth in Brooklyn. The program offers those caught up in the justice system in an inroad into art and connections to working artists in service as an alternative to incarceration while empowering young people to take charge of their own life and to imagine a positive future. I've gotten to learn about Alloy's 80, 80 Flatbrush project through our partnership, and I want to underscore one component of the project that has not gotten enough attention. Alloy's proposal to donate 15,000 square feet of cultural facility is critical to the future of this neighborhood and shows their true commitment to the arts. One of the biggest challenges arts organizations face is securing affordable and reliable real estate. This donation of space is desperately needed and will be a tremendous addition to the downtown Brooklyn community. Thank you. Professor Pratt Institute School of Architecture. I've been waiting for my students from the Christina Porter Memorial Library. I've got it. I've got it. I've been waiting for my students from the Christina Porter Memorial Lighting Lab. This is about our 13th or 14th study of shadowing of big buildings. And what we are, I thought they were going to be here, but now, but well, for example, in our successful Study. If I can get this loose. This is the kind of thing we're doing for this site, the whole area. This was in Vinegar Hill, and we were successful. The whole area that we've been looking at, is, besides the simulation on the computer system, we've been taking photographs all winter and spring to really see what the existing shadowing of existing buildings, including the two or three large buildings. And so, and so what we're, we're getting here, you're going to be having, and we'll send this to community board, my students are showing the shadowing of the existing buildings and axiometric so you can get a feel of how it really is. And then they're showing the huge new building and the incredible impact it's going to have. I, I, I know that the whole story about an hour in Fort Greene Park, but the whole idea is that the, the landscape goes up in the topography. There's going to be a lot more impact because that shadowing is going to be hitting more directly. And then there's a diffuse shadowing, the, the, the reflective uh, sunlight and shadowing that's occurring from the existing buildings. The new building will really make a big blockage among the existing two or three big buildings. And we think it's gonna have, have to be shown to you as the true impact of the shadowing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ticket holder 24. We'll hit ticket holder 25 and 26 come up front. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dan Marks. I'm a resident of downtown Brooklyn uh, with, my, with my wife and two year old son. Um, I'm also a board member of the uh, nonprofit organization Brooklyn Arts Council, which has an office uh, in Dumbo. Uh, I am here to voice my support for this project. Uh, one of the biggest concerns my family have, has is when our son gets of age to have to go to school. Um, we moved to this area because of the high quality daycare programs that were available. Um, we waited to get into one of the programs that were here, we got in, and then we chose to move here. We have a uh, grave concern of where our son is going to go to elementary school. And one of the reasons we wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly support this project is because of the addition of the elementary school and future high school as well. Um, we are also considering potentially moving out of the community board district to find better schooling solutions if the time comes. Well, this uh, this project will be able to provide those seats. 
Um, also, uh, a comment was made earlier about uh, there's too much culture in the area. I mean, I, I totally disagree. That I think I think Brooklyn can always add more culture, and I applaud Alloy for uh, adding 15,000 square feet of additional culture for the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, 25, I'm sorry, 25. Good evening, my name is Hannah Birnbaum and I'm testifying on behalf of 32BJ SEIU to express our union's strong support for rezoning of 80 Flatbush in downtown Brooklyn. The project's developer, Ally Development, is a responsible developer that is committed to creating good paying jobs at this project. In addition, we strongly support the project's commitment to the development of much needed affordable housing in this increasingly expensive neighborhood. As you may know, 32BJ SEIU is the largest property services workers union in the country. It has more than 160,000 members in 11 states in the District of Columbia. In New York City, our union's roots go back nearly 100 years. Over the decades, we've united office cleaners, apartment building workers, security officers, window cleaners, theater and stadium cleaners, and public school workers from all over the city and Long Island into one district with 80,000 members. One minute. We also represent nearly 600 members who live in Community District 2. Of the nearly 2,032 BJ members that work in Community District 2, 400 of them work in good paying jobs in residential buildings like what, like the one 80 Flatbush, at 80 Flatbush that Alia is proposing to develop. The 80 Flatbush project stands as a model of responsible development in our city. By creating good paying jobs that pay a fair wage and provide good benefits, Alloy Development will help its workers continue to live in, raise their kids in, and retire in New York City and this community. It is in our common interest to make sure that all city products, projects are equitable and benefit the entire community. Thank you. Take it over to 27 and 28. Please come up front. Good evening. My name is Deborah Lauder. Um, I have lived in Brooklyn for four weeks. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to express my strong opposition to this rezoning. Uh, when my husband and I decided um, to move to Brooklyn, we looked at a number of neighborhoods and a number of uh, different apartments. Um, we chose to live in Fort Greene because of its incredible transportation access, the diversity, the open space, and just the beauty of the neighborhood. My husband's hobby is gardening. So we were thrilled to find an apartment on Rockwell Place on the same block as the garden and knew it was a historic garden. When we reached out to the community uh, gardener uh, coordinator, uh, we were warmly welcomed into the neighborhood. Please do not think of this little triangle of land as just a garden. One minute. The people who have made it possible over the years have planted something much more than flowers and vegetation. They have planted and cultivated a community. I firmly believe that the proposed development will not only cast shadows on the vegetation, but on the healthy relationships that define community. That is not something that can be mitigated. Before we moved here, we were in the Columbus Circle area of Manhattan. I spent the last five years living through the development along 57th Street, and I brought tonight a picture I took of Central Park a few weeks ago. The shadows on Central Park are just devastating and they're irreversible. Please, please don't let that happen to this beautiful neighborhood in Brooklyn. Thank you. Take it over to Lisa. Hello, my name is Raphael Levy. I've been living in CB2 for the past 11 years. Since I became a member of the Brooklyn Bears Community Garden, I've taken the responsibility of watering the plants every morning. By doing this, every day I have encountered many people that has approached me with cash donations, requests for herbs and fruit samples that I am most happy to share with the community. People in general that want to share stories from their childhood and feel happy giving advice on how to grow bigger and taste his vegetables. I have experienced in the garden the interest these people show to learn and share their knowledge on flowers and vegetables. This is a daily parade of men, 
women and children on their way to work or school. One that, minute. That, thank you. That stop to share a moment to smell the roses and continue their daily routine and stresses of life. I've been, I've seen the change of attitude among people and the positive effect the garden has in changing, shaping their day and sprinkling a smile in their faces. In addition, I remember spending a good hour talking to three lady tourists from Australia who would not stop showing their surprise to find such a magical corner in the middle of a concrete jungle and praising the authorities and the community members for their approach to the nature in the urban environment. I ask you, respectively, members of this community board, to turn down the request for rezoning because I believe this would kill the garden and deprive these people of the chance to socialize and build bonds between community members. The permanent shade will make it possible for the vegetation to survive and in a place it will suffer to green for more cement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, community board members. The Williamsburg Savings Bank Building sits across. Yeah, my name is Grant Greenberg. Uh, the Williamsburg Savings Bank Building sits across the street from the site at 80 Flatbush. One handsome place, as the building is also known, was completed in 1929. It was once the tallest building in the borough, with 37 stories and 512 feet tall. It is among the tallest four-sided clock towers in the world. In 1977. The exterior of the Williamsburg Savings Bank building was landmarked by New York City. The exterior was actually landmarked 20 years before the interior was landmarked. And there's a reason for this. The findings of the, of the um, landmark committee or board was that on the basis of careful consideration of the history, the architecture, and other features of this building, the Landmarks Preservation Commission finds that the Williamsburg Savings Bank has a special character, special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development, one minute. heritage and cultural characteristics of New York City. The building has one of the world's tallest, largest four-phase dial clocks, and the building is a striking symbol of the Brooklyn's, uh, a, a striking symbol of Brooklyn. Um, in 2010, word spread in our neighborhood that uh, a building was going to be built next to one Hanson Place, and. Uh, Many of our residents were concerned that such a building built so near our building might affect the building and affect views of the clock tower, the landmark clock tower. As more information spread about the development, we discovered the developer had carefully weighted the bulk of the upper portion of the building away from the one Hanson Place clock tower so that views of the clock tower would be preserved. With additional consultation with the developer, the overall height of the building was reduced. This is the building that was built at uh, uh, on Ashland Place, and you can see the cutout here clearly shows the clock tower so that views are preserved from the western, uh, from the western neighborhoods. The building proposed by the developer at the site of 80 Flatbush will forever block these views. The developer will have you try to believe that they've made significant changes to the facade to make it more sensitive to its context next to the building, but a change of facade material and some minor setbacks to the structure do not solve the fundamental problem that these buildings are simply too high. I respectfully ask you to oppose the development as it is currently proposed. I'm going to call three names to the present please all come forward. Uh, the first one is Satrine Garomi, Carolyn Perry, Dan Marks, 29. Thank you. And number, ticket holders 30 and 31, please come up front. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jim Walden. I represent the Brooklyn Heights Association, and we oppose this project for a different reason. <laughs> One that is very central to everything that you've said. These projects are terrible urban planning. I mean, think about the problems that you have. Crumbling roads, rampant vermin, snarling traffic, insufficient hospitals, overcapacity schools, and dangerously crowded subways. And then the city goes to a developer and offers generous tax breaks for the developer to solve some of your problems. You are hungry to have your problems solved. And what do they offer you? Crumbs. And they ask you to accept it as a meal. 
all Newman once said, if you're playing in a poker game and you look around the table and you can't find the sucker, you're the sucker. I want to leave you with some words from Khalil Gibran, right? Because he's relevant in all this. He said, forget not that earth delights to feel your bare feet and the winds long to play in your hair. You will look through all of Khalil Gibran's very passionate quotes and you will not find a quote about living in the shadows beneath a skyscraper jungle. Thank you. Ticket holder 30. Ticket holder 31. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Winston Haman. I am the principal at Khalil Gibran International Academy. Uh, let me just begin by thanking all of you. This is my third or fourth intervention at these meetings, and I had never heard one single negative thing about my school. And for that, my students sitting over there, we thank you very much. Because I know, thank you. Because I know that when you push back, you're not pushing about our school. I know that. Right. So, let me begin by saying that. However, as the principal of a school, and, and, and that's been said a few times, I don't want to repeat, but it's going to listen, right? As a principal of a school of a building, who is true, we don't have enough electricity. In the summer or in the fall, the ACs, half of them don't work. We don't have a gym. We don't have an auditorium. The cafeteria is extremely small. Our classrooms are so small, not even to the standards of the DOE. Our hallways, our hallways are very narrow, right? So it's extremely difficult. Forget about me as a principal. Any principal in any school cannot run a school successfully with all these limitations, right? So I must support this project because it's a golden opportunity for my kids, 40% that come from Yemen and 22% that are special ed, to really, really come to a school that is a state at the art facility that will make them competitive in the 21st century. We don't have that. And it is true too. We believe in holistic education, not only the academic piece, the social emotional, but the physical. And every year I lose kids that wanna do basketball, wanna do volleyball, and I don't have the facility. I cannot even compete with a small league or whatever because my kids don't have a space to practice. And listen, I can give you plenty of examples, I got 30 seconds. Today, not yesterday, not last week, not last month, today. Last month was Black History Month. This month is Women History Month, right? My students are so talented, so they prepared this amazing, amazing uh, assembly, right, to present to, to the rest of the, of the school, right? Because I don't have an auditorium, I had to borrow and wait. This is March. Black History Month was last month. I had to wait for across the street, not band, the dance center across the street to lend me the space to have my assembly there. And guess what? Half of my school can only fit there because they just give me a favor and let me half of the place. So an assembly that in any other high school will take you one hour, my kids are losing six hours of instructional time to enjoy an assembly. That's simply not fair. Simply not fair. So for that, I approve this project. Thank you. I've lived in Borough Hill for almost 40 years. For me, for us, Borough Hill is a family, both the neighborhood and the people in it who live and work there. Borough Hill is organic. It's like a living being. It grows, it changes, it morphs. Through the decade, we nurtured Borough Hill and fought for it advocated the sensible development such as Hoyt Skimmerhorn. We weathered the economic hard times of the 70s and the 80s. We banded to stem the tide of crime. We partnered with officials and agencies, formed block associations and bids, walked together as block watchers, created welcoming gardens from blighted vacant lots. One minute. Resurrected parks and playgrounds, supported public schools, fostered the arts, initiated tutoring programs, collaborated in creating a center for the needy, cheered supportive housing. We try to attract businesses and development when no one wanted us. We appreciate that we abut the downtown area, an amenity we benefit from, the businesses, 
cultural centers, shopping, courts, parks, libraries, institutions of learning, and the best transportation. We are not strangers to expansion and change, but we must maintain the character and the spirit of Borham Hill and all the residential areas in Brooklyn. <coughs> Neighborhoods are the lifeblood of New York. The zoning changes that would allow 80 Flatbush will set a poor precedent for the entire city. Saif Schumann. Saif Schumann. Um, well, he's coming down. Peter G. And Stephen Smith. Hi everyone, um, my name is Dave Schumann, I'm 12 years old, and um, I live in the neighborhood where 80 Flatbush is planning to be built, and I'm starting the um, high school enrollment process, and I like to play basketball, so I'm looking for a high school that could fit my needs so I could continue to play the sport that I love, and I want Khalil Gibran International Academy to be that school but it can't be that school right now because they have no gym to support my needs of playing basketball. So I support the building being made um, so I can play basketball in that gym and continue to strive on the sport that I love. That's it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter G. I'm a board member of Fifth Avenue Committee, also known as FAP. FAC is a 40-year-old nonprofit economic de uh, community development organization whose mission is to advance economic and social justice. Um, we have a long history of organizing tenants and helping hundreds of New Yorkers each year through our eviction, eviction prevention work. Um, we have built 900 units of affordable housing in New York City and currently manage 519 units of it, um, where approximately 35% of our tenants are formerly homeless, and we are overseeing the lotteries of four inclusionary housing projects in CB2 and CB6 right now, where it's typical to receive 55,000 to 72,000 applications per affordable housing lottery for less than 100 affordable apartments. The demand for affordable housing cannot be overstated, especially housing at or below 60% AMI, which this project would be. FAP decided to partner with Alloy at 80 Flatbush because they have a demonstrated commi their commitment to ongoing community engagement and significant public benefits. They have agreed to more deeply, most, the most deeply affordable mandatory inclusionary housing option, option one, and will work with BAC to exceed um, what uh, mandatory uh, inclusive housing, including inclusionary housing option one requires. The permanently affordable housing at 80 Flatbush will also include one units minute. set aside for families coming out of the New York City shelter system, where tonight more than 60,000 people, two thirds of them children, are spending the night. FAC acknowledges the community's concerns and we hope they get addressed through the Euler process. The Board of Fifth Avenue Committee fully support this project and asks that CB2 votes, that they, uh, that as CB2 votes, that they weigh the significant public benefits and targeted needs that this project is designed to meet. We ask that you fully support this project. Thank you. Okay, so it's nine o'clock. And I've been instructed that we need to be out of here by 9.30, and I'm not even halfway through this list. So from going forward, we're gonna limit everybody to one minute. Ticket holders, 32 and 33, please come up front. And actually, ticket holder 32, you can go straight to the mic. Ticket holder 33 and 34, please come up front. Hello, and thank you for your time. We are Sonia Izzard and Nixie Fuentes, and we are here on behalf of the Riders Alliance and Tri-State Transportation Campaign, two local advocacy organizations working to improve public transit in New York City and the region. We are here today as transit advocates to express our support for the proposal to eliminate parking minimums at the proposed 80 Flatbush Avenue project. 
Our organizations have long supported the reduction or elimination of parking minimums for new development projects throughout seconds. New York City. Since 80 Flatbush is uh, near Atlantic Terminal, it's within uh, multiple subway lines as well as uh, uh, LIRR and buses. We think it's incredibly important that um, when you're near uh, transit that you build densely. And we also think that one thing we can't do is we can't tell people you can't live here. We want to see our subways and buses fixed. We need to make sure our public officials are putting funding into our subways and buses and not telling people they can't live in specific areas or anywhere in the city because everywhere is facing the same transit crunch. Uh, so we need to look toward removing these kinds of parking restrictions so that we can make sure we don't have traffic congestion and increase funding for subways and buses so people have places to go and can get around. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Mason Mohammed. I'm the PTA president of Khalil Gibran International Academy. Um, as everybody else knows, this school is a 150-year-old building. No bathroom, no facilities. It's not a school that you really want your kids to go to, but you have to because the lack of schools in the city. You all know there's not enough schools in your neighborhood. 30 seconds. All right. I support this project because it gives us another school. It's being built by a private developer which everybody knows and thinks they have ulterior motives. Of course, they gotta make money. They're building it for free, okay? So, it's gonna be a little hectic for people living in, around the project as with any other high-rise going up.